In the previous video, we took a first look at using this PERCOM disk controller in the Southwest Technical 6800 computer. And if you haven't watched that video yet, I'd go ahead and watch that first. It'll give you a good background to uh, help make this particular video a little bit clearer. Now in that video, we demonstrated the simple operating system that PERCOM provided with the board. It's on this single PROM right here. It was called MINIDOS. And operating system's kind of the wrong word. Basically, all it does is allow you to load programs from disk into memory and then save programs from memory back out to disk. And it did that without even letting you use file names. You had to keep track of which file was which by a location on the disk. Uh, a direct parallel to what you would have done with a cassette tape and your tape counter in terms of identifying where your files were on that tape. Now, they soon introduced the second prom right here called MPX. It was an extension for MiniDOS. So this is an extension. The MiniDOS parts say the same. And what the extension did is allow you to use file names instead of having to specify locations on the disk. These two together made a pretty much equivalent operating system to what Northstar was distributing with their systems over in the S100 world. Um, the primary difference, this one ran from EEPROM, whereas Northstar left it on the disk um, and booted the operating system from disk into RAM. Some advantages to each, and we discussed some of that in the last video if you want to take a look at that. Anyway, interestingly, MPX was actually just an acronym for MiniDOS plus extension. Um, MPX sounded a little cooler than the, uh, than the obvious that this was MiniDOS plus an extension. That, uh, that kind of made me chuckle when I first realized that's what MPX meant. But anyway, what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, put this board in the computer, and then we will fire it up and go through a demonstration of MPX. All right, the computer is up and running. As you can see, we've been examining some memory locations using Swatbug. In order to use any of the disk features, we have to jump to the EEPROM up on the PERCOM card. That's at C1000. So do a jump to C1000, and you can see we have a prompt here. Now, we are presently in the second PROM, the extension PROM of MPX. And the reason that jumping to MiniDOS got us into the extension prom is because the MiniDOS prom from day one was designed to look for an extension prom in that second socket. And if it's there, it jumps to it. So right now we are in the second prom actually, even though we jumped to the standard C1000 entry point. All right, the commands uh, in MPX are one letter commands. There's several of them. One of them is X, which means exit back to, um, to the monitor, to swap bug. Uh, the reason I did this was to illustrate a SWAT bug command that we're going to use over and over from now on called Z. Z is the exact same thing as a jump C1000. And that was implemented because SWAT bug, excuse me, Southwest also used C1000 for their EEPROM board as a common entry point. And so that makes it very easy on this PERCOM just to get back anytime you want into MPX. So from now on, when I go back into the PROM, I'm just going to jump, use the Z to jump to C1000. All right, the next command you'd probably try is the files command. It's basically a directory. All right, you can see we have six character file names, no extension. So it's fairly limiting, even more so than like CPM. But it's better than writing down just numbers and not having file names at all. And along with that, you can see a lot of the information of the types of things we were typing in when we were running this before. You can see like the first sector, last sector was always computed for us. Here's the address in memory that we saved it from, 100 through DFF. Here's the address it starts at. Again, the reason this looks like MiniDOS is because it is MiniDOS. We've just simply added a file name system and directory on top of it. Completely interchangeable for the most part, as we'll see in a little bit. All right, um, loading programs is really easy. All you have to do is type the name of one of them and it'll load it and run it. Uh, if you recall last time, we ran a 4K basic. This is it right here, it's starting at sector 10. If you go look at that video, you see we actually loaded it from sector 10 to run it on, um, with MPX, you just type the name of the program and hit return. All right, and uh, we're up and running in that 4K basic. Now this 4K basic, again, has no knowledge whatsoever of disks or anything. In fact, it expected to be using paper tape and cassette back from the swap bug. So let's put in a simple little program. My favorite programs of all. All right, so there you go. So to, to save this, you would have done, um, you'd gone to the monitor and what this thing does is it sets up A002 for you in order to punch to paper tape. Because if you recall, the punch command uses the values in A002 through A005 to know what range of memory to punch, 0D55 through 0D7D. 
But we can use that same information just like before to save this. So we're gonna do a save, give it a file name. Let's call it TSC test. And the range of memory is 0D55 to 0, where am I, 0D7D, and just hit return. So this did the same thing that we did in the previous video. See, we have TSC test here, 0D55 to 0D7D, took up one sector. So now I can uh, just load that into memory. Well, actually, let's go ahead and uh, jump back into the program in, in clear memory. Uh, the J command is the same as SWAT bugs jump command. Address I'm jumping to is 103 because TSC basic starts at 100. So the convention in all the Southwest programs was um, the cold start address may have been 100 or 200 or 300. The re-entry, the warm start address would be that plus three. That's enough room for a jump basically. All right, so that program's in there. Let's do a scratch. All right, so now it's all gone. We have a monitor back here, and now we can load. Oops, you can't type the whole word. It has to be just the letter L. L and TSC test. That loads that into the program space for our uh, basic. And now you can see we've got it back. So here's a program that knows nothing about disks or anything. It expected paper tape, but obviously we can interface with that and use it with our disk, just like we did in the previous video. All right, so along with file names um, and an extra EEPROM, they also provided a number of uh, programs with a disk that came with MPX, uh, including a very nice basic. This Percom basic is a full disk basic um, equivalent to like extended basic for Altair. Uh, 6800 assemblers on here. Let's go ahead and run the, the Percom basic. These are aware of MPX, meaning you can actually load files from within um, from within the program. So for example, I can say load Lunar. I have Lunar Lander out there. It's aware of the MPX file system, goes out and finds Lunar and loads it in for us. You can see this is a pretty good sized program. So we don't have to do the monkeying around with memory and that kind of thing like we did with that TSC basic. Let's go ahead and play a game of uh, Lunar Lander. Uh, let's go ahead and just do free fall for a while. This is us falling and the eye over here, that column is the ground where we're headed towards. All right, let's put on some brakes here. See, I'm getting close. What do you know, perfect landing. All right, and of course, as you'd expect, you can also issue a save command to save something back. Um, it also has an exit command by typing mini DOS and you're back to the prompt here. So that's a, a really nice extended disk basic. It's fully aware of, um, of MPX. That's pretty nice. Uh, ASM, it's a uh, standard Motorola style 6800 assembler. Now, if you recall in the last couple of videos, we had a little demo program where it prompted you for a string and you could type it in. I have the source code for that in here. Um, so we can load that. I call it S demo. I'll put the small S in front to indicate it's a source file, um, the object file. You can see I've done this before. I put an O in front of it and, um, that allows me to tell which one is which. And if I ever make a loadable, I'll just eliminate that and just call it demo. All right. You can see the source file here. Uh, we can go back to uh, mini DOS and I'm going to delete that, uh, the uh, object file, so you know that we're making a new one here. So I got rid of the O demo. So let's go ahead and go back. We'll jump to 103, and now we're back into this. All right, we'll go ahead and assemble it. Breaking this and manually controlling your passes was pretty standard with the Motorola assembler in the early days, is how Motorola themselves did it. So I just ran the first pass, which generates a simple table. Uh, you can then run a second pass and generate a listing. That was what the L did. Here's a nice listing. Um, if you want to generate the object code, we'll do a 2D, which is going to write it to disk. And now we'll go ahead and write the, uh, the object code as ODEMO. It takes a little bit of time to generate the code for this. And when it's done, it'll have written an S record file, as we'll see in just a minute. So it doesn't write a binary file. It's an S record file, which is what all... Um, standard assemblers did, like you saw us loading S records in the past, that was because the assemblers generated S records. So we'll go on back to here and you'll see that we've got the O demo. Now, interestingly, you can take a look here and see we've got, uh, where was the hole? Okay, so this ran, the source is 122 to 127 and then we skipped 128 because that's where O demo was. 
So we've got a hole in memory and we'll, we'll, we'll address what this happens, a uh, hole in the disk space. We'll address that in just a second. All right, so Odemo is a, um, oops, it's case sensitive here. Odemo is an object file from the assembler. It's gonna be an S record file. Now type is one of the utilities that came on the disk. It's just a program that runs. It's not a built-in command. It's just a program that gets loaded and it'll type out the contents Odemo for us. And you can see it's an S record file. Uh, there's no way to run an S record file. You have to somehow load it in. Now, when it came in from cassette or paper tape, the, the load command in SWATBUG converted it. So we need something here to take a disk file and convert it into binary for us. That's what this hex loader program is up here. So we can run hex loader. And it's asking for a file name. Now, it doesn't know anything about file names, to be truthful. It wants the, the number, disk number, sector number thing we did in the previous video. So we're going to convert O demo from S records into binary. So it's at one sector 147 on drive one. So one, 147. And that loaded these S records to wherever it said that it needed to go. And these are at 100. So now if we jump to 100, here is our uh, program. Um, I've been messing around with it. That's why it has such a long prompt there. Okay, so it's in memory at 100. So, um, Let's go ahead and go back. And so now we could actually save that out if we wanted. So let's do a save and let's call it demo instead of O demo or S demo because this is the actual executable. It ran from 0100 to 017F is more than enough. And start address is 100. So we've now written our own program and we can run it anytime we want. Simple as that. All right, now this hex loader program is interesting. You can see it ran at 2000 hex. That's up nice and high so that most of your programs that run down at 100 um, won't clobber hex loader as it's loading it. But what if you were loading a big program or what if you wanted to work on hex loader itself which loads at 2000 and it clobbers itself as it loads? You would actually need to run this program somewhere else. Well, fortunately, in 6800 code, it's pretty easy to write position-independent code that can be stuck anywhere in RAM and it will run. Hex loader was written that way, so I can load it at 4000 instead of 2000 if I wanted, anytime I want. Um, the problem is, is that MPX does not allow you to type in one of these programs and say load it somewhere else. It's always going to load it where it belongs. Um, but if you recall, last week, we demonstrated that MiniDOS allowed you to override that. So we can actually go into mini-dos with the M command. We are now at the mini-dos prompt. I can do L, no prompt on the mini-dos prompt. I can do a load command, hex loader, gonna come from drive one, sector 110. And normally we would put in FFFF to make it load um, at its default address, but we're gonna put in a override address of 4,000. And so now we can actually just jump to 4,000 and there's our hex loader program. So that's a neat thing about 6800, easy to write position independent code that can be put anywhere. There's a neat thing about the interchangeability of MPX and MiniDOS. We can kind of switch back and forth between them because again, this MPX file name system is just um, a layer and extension on top of MiniDOS. We're still running MiniDOS. All right, what else is of interest here? Um, a few commands that we haven't looked at yet. You can rename a file. For example, let's take uh, what do we have on here? Lunar. Let's rename Lunar Moon. And so now it's called Moon. Um, what else? We did delete already. You can actually use these utilities. This is not a built-in command. This is a program. So we can copy Moon to Lunar. And this will make a new copy of Moon and stick it out at the end. All right, so now you can see we have Lunar down here. Now here's a good example of, that's the kind of thing you would do in order to grow a file. You would copy it to the end. So now Lunar is at the end. And when the file's at the end, we can do an append. You'll see right now this runs from 150 to 167. The next three sectors, 168. This will append 10 sectors to Lunar. Now the file is still from 150 to 167, but the next free is now 178 instead of 168. 
that means if you create a new file, it'll leave that room for Lunar. So Lunar can grow if you were editing it. So you, you might have to do that if a file got uh, bigger and bigger because you were changing it. Um, so let's go ahead and delete the moon. All right, so we've deleted a file. We might have some other holes in here I don't know about. Can you get your space back? You can see we're up through 178 or 167 here. This pack program will do that for us. You pack, say pack and give it a drive number. You can hear it busy working. All right, so we were at 167, 158. So now we're down to 148. Now it did take away the extra space we put at the end of Lunar. So after a pack, if you want that extra space, you'll have to do that again. So you now we'll be up to 159. So that gets you some free space back whenever you need to. Um, all right, this actually does work with multiple drives. You can proceed most of these commands with a, a drive number and a slash, so like two slash or three slash for other drives. Um, if you don't provide it a slash, as you can see here, it was going through drive one. All right, so as primitive as this was, um, it's actually relatively capable. Um, it's nice and fast. There's no big uh, delays with it. It's not like having to use cassette or paper tape by any means. Now, it certainly isn't up to what you'd expect from, you know, MS-DOS or even CPM. Uh, and those were coming very shortly after this. Uh, but it compares nicely to Northstar DOS, which is probably its closest competitor this time over in the S100 world. The next thing we're going to look at is a higher-end operating system that came out called Flex. It was written by technical systems consultants, TSC. That's who wrote this TSC basic, for example. And it became the standard high-end operating system for the 6800 and later the 6809 computers, much like CPM became the standard on the S100 side. Um, unfortunately, I do not have one of the supported floppy controllers for this. Um, Southwest and TSC didn't jump in and support PERCOM on their own. Uh, I believe PERCOM eventually ported Flex to run on their controller, but I don't have any of the sources for that. I may actually try to do that myself here as my next project is get Flex running on this PERCOM controller. And once I have that, I will then be able to demonstrate Flex for you. Or if I get one of uh, Southwest's own disc controller boards, but right now I haven't seen too many leads for those. So maybe the next video will be Flex running on a PERCOM controller. All right, that does it for this video.